Hello, hello, Andrew. Hello, I'm here. Welcome to this uh, hybrid event organized by DSM Avocat Lacour and uh, Damovo Lares. Uh, can the webinar participant please confirm that the, the sound is working in the chat? Hello, can you can you hear us? Can you put a, a message on the in the chat? We don't have any. Loud and clear, I can hear you. That's perfect. Okay, so we can start, we can start. So hello everybody and uh, welcome to this uh, virtual and uh, in-person conference on the topic of different perspective on sensitive data, cybersecurity and law in light of the GDPR era. I am Maxim Kush and I will quickly present the, the online tool for the webinar participants, uh, our firm, DSM Avocat Lacour, Renault Le Square N, and uh, then I will pass the, the microphone to Jean-François Termino, who will present uh, Damovo as a managing director of Damovo Luxembourg. Hello, everybody. So with respect to Livestorm, uh, only your first name will appear to the other participants in the webinar. Uh, also, as you can see, you have a chat tab to exchange among yourself and the question tab for the Q&A later. So the, the webinar will be more or less one hour, uh, and we will have a Q&A uh, after. We will take some questions uh, from the webinar and also from, uh, from you uh, in, the, in the conference room here at DSM Avocat. Uh, so um, yes, maybe a few words about uh, DSM. I will change the, the slide. So yeah. DSM Avocat Lacour, we are an independent full service business law firm specializing in MA, business law, real estate, digital, and labor law, as well as dispute resolution, among other practice areas. Uh, also, a few words about uh, Renaud Le Square N, who will be the, the speaker for, for DSM. So, he is uh, as a partner at DSM Avocat Lacour. Renaud Le Square N has over 15 years' experience in new technology matters. Since 2014, he has been head of DSM Avocat Lacour Digital Department and advised his clients in their digitalization. In parallel, Renault is involved locally through his participation as director of several associations such as ECOM, APSI, and APDL. Uh, one word also for those of you who would like a certificate of attendance, uh, you can uh, send me an email. I will put my email address in the chat and uh, we will come back to you in the, in the next days. Uh, all right. Uh, I hope you will enjoy the webinar and the conference, and I leave the floor to, to Jean-François Termino. Thank you, Maxime. Uh, just some words about, words about Damovo, and to explain why we are there today. Uh, Damovo, uh, maybe you know or you don't know, but it's, it's, it's a company uh, in more than 30 uh, countries today, and more than 2,500 uh, workers. So we are specialized in uh, ICT as integrator, but also uh, thanks to uh, the acquisition of, of Lares and Andrew is there today. Uh, Lares is also our cybersec division. And then we can bring also a lot of, of, uh, of uh, solution. So we are based in, in Canton uh, today. So Damovo was, uh, it was eight people last year. Today we are 27 people. So increase uh, very, very fast. And we, I hope, and we continue to, to do the things to, to grow more and more. We are, as I said, IC integrator in both data security and as multi vendors. So, uh, Lares uh, joined, joined officially, I think, the 1st of February, uh, Damovo Group, and it's our, our uh, cybersec division. So, I hope and you will enjoy uh, this, uh, this, uh, this presentation. Sorry, maybe I just. Uh, uh, Maxim, just put, don't uh, touch uh, the right key, but I think that you can move it. And then, yes, I can let, uh, and I can let uh, now uh, Renault to, to uh, introduce uh, the real part of the, of the meeting. And thank you for your attendance. Hi, everyone. So uh, first, thank you for the participant uh, in, in physics in our uh, premises. And also thank you for all the people who uh, join us uh, virtually through, through this, uh, this tool. 
Um, the idea of this presentation is to share a uh, view from a legal standpoint and from a technical standpoint. So uh, first, uh, I want to thank um, Damovo for its participation and Andrew for uh, being the, 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 the speaker for the IT part uh, with me, whereas I will speak about the, the legal aspects, as you can imagine. Um, and the idea again is to have a mixed view over the situation uh, which uh, all the companies in Luxembourg, in EU and uh, even uh, abroad EU uh, are facing now. So, um, as you can see uh, on this slide, we will have a short introduction, then we will discuss about the outsourcing legal and technical rules. Uh, then the security of the transfer of data outside EU, then legal and technical supervision upon, uh, generally speaking, uh, data processing, but also transfer of data. And uh, last but not least, we will present a GDPR certification that is uh, ongoing, which is called Euro Privacy. And then we will end with a Q&A uh, session. <clears throat> so, uh, I will try to be uh, relatively uh, quick on this first uh, part. What are the legal requirements when we're talking about outsourcing? First, uh, there is the, 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 the general rules applicable based on the GDPR. So uh, to make it short, you will have to define the scope. You will have to map third party with which you will work, to which you will transfer data or from which you will receive uh, data. You will have to map type of data, applications to be used, purpose of each processing. You will have to take care, of course, all the time for every processing on the lawfulness of the processing. So it's bad you have to comply with one of the uh, allowed um, uh, legal grounds under Article 6 of the GDPR. So this, those, those, those elements are applicable for all elements in the GDPR, but of course also uh, when we're talking about outsourcing. And then there is the specific, the specific conditions uh, under Article 28 of the GDPR, which are Article 28.1, processor providing sufficient guarantees. And this was the idea of this presentation. Uh, you have to take care and you have to check the partner with whom you will work. You cannot simply rely on the fact that there are IT professionals or any type of marketing presentation. You have to make an assessment of the ability to provide the services and the required security. So this is a, this is a key point. Uh, beginning uh, 2018, that was maybe not uh, a very, very strong point on which players were, were, were focusing. Now it become very important. So this is something to keep in mind. Then there is the, the Article 28.2. <clears throat> you must not engage another processor without prior specific or general retail authorization of the controller. And this is also something that we face more and more with litigation, ongoing litigation, complaint for, from uh, data uh, processor, complaint from uh, people involved in data breaches. So this is something, again, that was maybe not uh, at first line uh, two years before, but now it became a hot topic. So uh, you have to watch your uh, IT agreements and notice uh, to the, your, your, your global policies to check that you have received the authorization to sub-process uh, your, your processing. Then Article 28.3, which is the uh, list uh, of the uh, elements that shall be included in a data uh, protection agreement. So we will quickly go through this list. I will not enter into the detail. This list is more or less is, is the same since two years. We have more uh, clarification from the various data protection authorities since then, but still this is relatively clear. Uh, the processor shall process data in accordance with instructions from the controller. This is the ID, one of the main ID of the GDPR. On this, this is something sometimes very complicated to uh, make the distinction between the data processor and the controller, especially in IT uh, tools, because sometimes you have on one side um, the, the, the controller which says, I want to develop this or that tool, and on the other side you have an IT company with the ability, the technical ability to develop this tool. So this processor 
uh, will uh, have the, the, the technical solution, but will not be the one in charge of defining the purpose and finality of, uh, of the, the processing. So in that case, you will have to assess whether it's a situation of controller processor or joint controller. So this is something that is complicated. Another point on this, um, when we're talking about group of companies, you will exchange data. There will be outsourcing, for instance, the administrative staff will generally be organized in one company for the whole group, and you, there will be a couple of transfer intra-group. So to, to, to make things more easy, uh, it is recommendable to use a, an intra-group data protection agreement with all the companies which can adhere to this agreement and where you will define all the different processing. So that's, that will be based on your register. So you can use pages of your register as appendixes, but the idea is to make it efficient, sim simple, and easy to handle. On this uh, agreement, uh, you will also uh, ensure that um, <clears throat> All the persons involved in the processing are subject to confidentiality obligations, uh, that your partner has appropriate technical and organizational measure to ensure the level of security that is required. On this, again, you cannot simply rely on the elements that are in the agreement. The idea is not to go through an audit up to the end of the chain, but at least to be able to document the reason why you opted for this type of uh, partner and what makes you confident that it is allowed, it is capable of uh, providing a, a secured service. This is also very important. It became very important given the data breaches we are uh, facing, uh, notably since last year and the COVID and, uh, and uh, homework uh, situation. Um, <clears throat> then um, you need to have the prior written consent of the controller to make a sub-processor. Uh, everyone up to the end of the chain should provide the same type of security, so you cannot simply rely on your IT system. You also have to be sure that your partner and sub-partner, as the case may be, have a similar security uh, system measure um, uh, environment. Um, there is an obligation of assistance with uh, the processor. There is a need to mention whether data will be erased or um, sent back to the, to the controller at the end of the processing. Uh, and then you must provide to the controller the information necessary to demonstrate compliance and enable or assist with audits. So this is something also that has to be taken into consideration, whether you will allow and under which circumstance uh, audit to be performed on your IT, because it's sometimes uh, opposed to your secure, to your um, confidentiality obligations. So you have to manage this, uh, this agreement, Article 28.4, same data protection obligations shall be imposed to the sub-processor as well. So these are the legal requirements, the standard legal requirements. In Luxembourg, we also have to deal with additional uh, specific rules. So we can have additional specific rules in various industries. This could be health industry. This could be uh, telecommunication industry. We took the example of the financial industry here. Uh, so you have to take care to be aware that when dealing with uh, personal data in financial industry, you are subject to an additional layer, uh, layer of uh, rules. Uh, coming from the, the Luxembourg uh, Financial Supervision Authority, the, the CSSF. And just quick example, uh, you might be subject to a prior authorization from the CSSF or to prior notification, and you have to be aware that th those obligations will evolve in the time. For instance, very recently, uh, it's applicable since 15 October, so we are only the 19. Um, there was a need of prior authorization for material IT outsourcing. Now it has been changed. It's uh, only only it's a prior notification. It's not an authorization anymore, so it's a bit faster, but still. You have two uh, very important um, uh, CSSF circular. 
uh, which treat on the uh, modalities to apply and to fulfill to, uh, to outsource uh, in this financial world. The one is the 17 slash 654 um, on the cloud computing. So you have the rules applicable when uh, supervised uh, entity wants to uh, outsource in the cloud uh, part of its activity. And then for the other uh, IT aspects, <coughs> In the nutshell, you have the, the circular 17656, which has been, both have been amended very recently again. And then I let the floor to Andrew for the technical aspects. Great. Thank you very much. Um, one thing that I find interesting is, you know, just like in technical security, uh, the, the idea of memorizing numbers and subsections and rules doesn't go away. It's a whole other host of things to remember. Uh, another thing I like to say is uh, I am I'm Canadian working for a company in the United States. So uh, any legal questions I probably cannot answer and they likely don't apply uh, to most of my life anyway. So uh, please don't ask me legal questions uh, because you will not get a valid answer. Uh, many of you know this, especially when exporting or outsourcing to a non-EU company. Um, so the European company will act as the customer, non-EU company is the supplier, and the, the EU company will act as a data controller. This I will tell you that this information, especially in North America or outside of the EU, is foreign territory because it's not something that many organizations have had to think of until GDPR was brought into play. Uh, and it was just dropped on their desk of, you need to know this now. So one, one issue that I've seen come up quite frequently is an EU customer looking to bring on a supplier that is outside of the European Union for data enrichment or for uh, additional knowledge uh, being ascribed to that customer information. And the, the, the sheer amount of loopholes and ways around it that the end supplier tries to make, like, oh, just put it on a laptop uh, and send us the laptop. If they ever say that, that should set off all sorts of alarms in your head because uh, you're taking data that is going to be very difficult to trace from point A to point B, point B being that non-EU company that's doing the enrichment. Uh, or I've also seen people say, well, we'll stand up a cloud instance outside of the EU that we'll control. Uh, just move your data there. We'll do all the enrichment and then you can pull it back in. That's, you know, additional alarm should go off in your head because they are trying to disrupt that paper trail of enriching or working with that customer's data. So, if a non-EU company plans to use that information for its own purposes, which I guarantee you, uh, even if you have contractual language that says you cannot use the data, they will push very hard for the resulting data from enrichment or from computational processes to be their intellectual property. So. Uh, this is where legal comes into play. You need to make sure that the derivatives of any enrichment or working with the data becomes covered as part of your intellectual property and your customers. I've filled out, so as a, uh, a virtual CISO, virtual DPO in a non-EU or non-EU region, I have worked with a lot of companies helping them interpret and answer the questionnaires that are sent by EU customers. Uh, I will tell you, as someone that has been working in software and startup worlds 
for the last 20 years, depending on who answers that questionnaire, uh, you will get on one hand, one end of the scale, you'll get very valid, articulate answers. On the other hand, you'll get a sales or a product manager that says yes to everything in order to close the deal and satisfy the requirements. Uh, those questionnaires are intended to prove that sufficient actions have been taken by the controller, but and, and to ensure that supplier meets the requirements of GDPR, but you need to know that many of the suppliers outside of the EU likely do not know the intricacies of GDPR because this is new to them. They may have just expanded into the EU or they may have started working with clients and uh, organizations that are subject to GDPR. So they will do everything they can to work with you as an EU customer, um, but you really do need to take every questionnaire that comes back to you with a grain of salt, treat it as draft. I would, I would be very hesitant to take their answers at face value without further clarification or evidence from that supplier. Uh, and in my experience, it's usually cleared up by a single phone call uh, to the CISO or the DPO. And I'll talk about that in a moment because in North America, <clears throat> North America specifically, that is often the same person depending on the size of the organization, which again, should set off alarms in your head. The next point is about security of the transfer of data outside the EU, which is a very hot topic especially since July 2020, uh, and uh, the decision called Schrems II. Um, from a legal perspective, um, GDPR allows transfer of data inside the EU uh, without any blocking and formality obligations. So it's the free flow of data uh, within the, 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 the EU. Uh, outside uh, EU, there are some mechanisms to comply with to allow and render the transfer uh, lawful. Uh, there are three main uh, tools that can be used. It's the first one is the adequacy decision from the European Commission. So there is a list that is published on the, uh, on the Commission website with um, countries that are deemed to be uh, to apply the same uh, standard in terms of data protection. Uh, for the time being, uh, United Kingdom is on the list. There, there is um, a clause under which there will be a, re a reassessment of the situation in the coming years. But uh, for the time being, you have the updated list and United Kingdom is on the list. Then there is a system of binding corporate rules. So it's for large companies. Uh, it's a large document which will detail the processing the way things are organized within the group and those binding corporate rules shall be uh, validated by uh, national data protection authority so this is something we uh, meet from time to time but to be honest not very not that frequently uh, and then there is the main uh, tool that is used uh, to, to organize a uh, transfer uh, outside eu which are called the standard contractual clauses. Uh, there was a new, uh, the release of a new set of clauses uh, end of June this year with, um, uh, so there was a transition period and uh, until end of September with four modules depending on the situation. So those uh, new standard contractual clause fulfill a gap that was existing under the previous ones, notably when we were talking about relation between sub-processor and sub-sub-processor, but not only. So now you have four modules to use. Uh, depending on the situation, you will use one or the other. Uh, to be honest, we, we, we deal with those clauses since a couple of months already. Uh, they are not that easy to handle. Uh, we have to first define uh, the situation where we are, which usually is relatively easy. And then we have to opt within the modules which uh, situation and which are what, what are the choices of the, of the signatories. But still, this is a very positive evolution. 
Then there is the point uh, of uh, the decision Schrems 2. What was this decision about initially? It was a discussion about the system that was put in place between uh, United States and the European Commission called Privacy Shield, uh, under which companies were adhering to this Privacy Shield, uh, the US companies were uh, allowed to receive and uh, to import and to export data freely uh, with uh, European uh, companies. So the decision Schrems to render null and void this, uh, this uh, privacy shield agreement. Uh, the decision was uh, that uh, even though there is this commitment from the company to fulfill with uh, GDPR applicable rules, there are under the, the, the local uh, legislation in the US uh, obligations for US companies to give access under certain circumstances to certain type of authority to their data. And this was considered by the court as a breach uh, of the GDPR rules and generally speaking, as non-compliant with the uh, environment uh, we want to keep in Europe with, uh, when it comes to uh, personal data. Uh, the first thinking about Schrems 2 was to say, okay, that concerns only uh, the relation between relationship between EU and the United States. So my first comment is that's not the case. That, that applies to uh, all non-EU uh, countries. So if a European company has, um, wants to transfer data to India, to China, or wherever else in the, in the world, it will have to apply the result and the, 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 the outcome of this Schrems 2 um, decision. This is clearly not only applicable to uh, the US situation. I'm, I'm, I'm especially happy to be here with Damovo and with Andrew because he knows very well the situation being Canadian, like uh, he just explained. And uh, this is there is a question uh, all the players in Luxembourg are, are facing now. Are they still entitled to work with US companies? And I'm talking about Microsoft and the big, the, the, the big major companies. And the, the answer is very complicated, and it will really depend on the type of data and the situation. The point of this Schrems 2 uh, decision is that the company has to make its own assessment on the uh, legal system in the country uh, the company wants to export data. And this has not been done successfully by the European Commission, so I doubt this could be done successfully by a private company. This is, this is my feeling. But the hot potato was transferred to the companies. So this is the first thing. I hope that in the coming months or years, this will be, uh, th there will be another approach. Uh, because this is not indelible and long term, uh, in, my, uh, in my opinion. Um, still, there was a release of recommendation from the EDPB, so European Data Protection Board which tries to give measures that can be implemented by companies, so very pragmatical things, uh, to um, allow them at the end of the day to transfer data, notably to the US, but not only. Um, one of the steps is, as I just mentioned, an assessment on the uh, judicial system in this country, which to be, again, is totally unrealistic for, uh, for a company. Uh, maybe we can think of something for lar very large companies, uh, clearly not for uh, small companies, um, SME, medium companies. This is, this is not uh, clearly not possible. So they will have to rely on third party opinions, and this is already what is done. Nevertheless, there will be an assessment, a written documentation to be done, first on this legal step, and then on the technical aspect that will be implemented to increase the level of security of data that will be transferred uh, to the US. And third, there is an assessment, but you, I invite you to read this, this recommendation. It's not very long, it's a couple of pages. Um, you will have to make an assessment on first, the type of data you will export, and secondly, the type of people who are concerned by those data. And depending on the sensitivity of both uh, of the answer uh, on those two questions, uh, you will either increase or decrease the level of risk you can accept organize it while organizing this, this transfer. Andrew? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, and th this kind of goes back to what was previously said about the size of the organizations. 
Uh, if a non-EU organization has a large international presence, they are likely going to have a designated data protection officer. Uh, and unfortunately, it will fall on, in my experience, uh, whoever or whomever asks the question of who's the DPO. So it could be the CISO, the CTO, the CFO, someone in finance, a manager, a VP, uh, someone in the risk organization or some in the compliance. I have actually been on calls where I've asked people, who is your DPO as their VC so? And the immediate response is, well, can't you handle that? Like, well, yes, I, I can handle that, but it, is this a new thing to you? Have you not looked at your data protection requirements from a, a global perspective? And because, because a lot of, um, specifically North American companies are North American centric, uh, being that their primary organizations that they're going to sell to are also within North America. The idea of complying with additional legislation outside of the borders of North America is always an afterthought. There's very few startups that say, you know, from day one, we are going to make sure that we have a DPO. If it's a three person organization, it is likely going to be two technical co founders or three technical co founders, maybe a salesperson. Uh, but the DPO tends to fall on whomever gets the email first from the customer asking who the DPO is. So this brings up the idea of having a virtual DPO uh, to help organizations through this. And the, th this is relatively new territory for non-EU organizations. And I know GDPR has been around, but you are going to have to be patient with non-EU companies because you are going to act as their guide, helping them through things. If you start citing specific requirements in terms of uh, numbers and subsections, if they've never seen it before or you know, they don't know where to look, that is going to be an additional level of stress and difficulties for them to comply with because now they have to go and figure out what numbers you're talking about and, and what that is. So you may, if you want to help these non-EU organizations out, you are going to have to dial it back a bit and really approach it with uh, baby steps to help them through the process if this is an organization that you really want to do business with. So that's, that's my word of caution. And I've been on both sides of, uh, of the conversation of, you know, here, go read these regulations. You need to comply with these. And either, you know, the organization will say, look, we're not going to do this because we, you know, this isn't part of our business. This isn't part of our business. Um, or they're going to say, okay, we'll, we'll look at this, but it's going to take a while for us to wrap our arms around it. So if you help them, you can get through the process much quicker. And what about the, the responsibilities of the controller and the processor? So as documented, the, the controller and processor has to implement pseudonymization, which is very difficult to say most days, and encryption of personal data. So pseudonymization is where you process the data in such a manner that you cannot attribute that personal data to a specific data subject without additional information or additional enrichment. So this, this is something that is programmatic, uh, is going to be accomplished by code or a third party vendor or service provider to do this. Uh, the the idea of rolling your own your own method to do this pseudo nominization is not recommended uh, just like rolling your own encryption algorithm is not recommended if you can rely on a third party or a known 
process that is documented and vetted to say this is the process that we use to anonymize the data, then that is going to make conversations with third parties a lot easier because you're not having to explain your newly invented process for trying to pseudo anonymize the data. The next thing is the ensuring of ongoing confidentiality, confidentiality, integrity, availability, resilience of processing systems. This is typically something that has fallen on the CISO in the past from a business continuity, disaster recovery, uh, the CIA triad, making sure that the data is safe and secure and available to be processed. But up until recently, they haven't had to think about the end customer privacy data. So uh, hit the wrong button here. So you need to think about, you know, what encryption algorithms and processes can we use to maintain the confidentiality of the data? Are we going to be monitoring the integrity of the data, whether it is in a database? Is it going to be at the record level? Is it the row level? Is it the entire database? Is it written to a file? We need to make sure that we're monitoring that integrity using cryptographic checksums that can be validated. And availability and resilience, can we access the data for business use when we need to access it? And if something goes down, is the data and architecture built in a resilient fashion that we can, we can access it in order to continue doing business? So again, things that we've done in the CISO office for years, but now uh, I, I would highly doubt that the DPO would be worried about this. This is something that they would work with the, the CISO on making sure that their use cases are also considered in the security and, and compliance use cases. Uh, what about restoring the availability and access to personal data in a timely manner if there's a technical or physical incident? You know, backups are great, but backups are only as good as the last test restoration of that data. You can take up backups for 10 years and feel really good that you're doing backups, but if you haven't restored one of those backups in 10 years, you have no knowledge as to whether that restoration is going to work and get you back online. So I, you know, I've worked at banks, uh, I've worked at a bank in Bermuda, I've worked at higher education institutions, uh, I've worked at a number of companies where they've swore that the, the backups work and then they go to restore them at three in the morning or four in the morning due to a technical issue or uh, some sort of catastrophic failure only to find out, hey, you know what? They didn't work. So that's not only is that not the time of mourning that you want this to happen, but it's a horrible situation to put yourself in and your business in. So please test those backups. And, uh, you know, what about testing and assessing and measuring the effectiveness of your technical controls, your organizational measures, so your policies, your standards, your procedures. This is where the privacy and security and compliance, it becomes, it really turns into one specific pillar or a grouping of individuals working together because you need to have a, an effective cybersecurity program that covers security, compliance, and privacy requirements because you need unification across all of those disciplines. You cannot have privacy out on an island doing their own thing, security doing their own thing, and then the compliance and risk team doing their own thing. Because in the face of an incident, that's not going to work because everyone's done their own thing. Nobody knows how to restore things in a way that meets their business model and their documentation. You need that unification across those disciplines.
and now the um, legal and technical supervision. When we're talking about um, data protection, uh, we have to uh, discuss a bit about the, the supervision. Andrew already uh, had a word about the DPO. We will uh, be a bit more precise from a legal standpoint. So the data protection officer's mission rely on main on six main points. Monitoring of compliance. So he has the duty to uh, understand the processing, how it works, monitor everything, and uh, have a clear view on what is done. So clearly there will be a need of a mapping to be, uh, to be done internally for the processing existing within the company, but also of course toward third parties, either in EU member states or uh, our, or, or outside uh, to non-EU uh, member states. The second point is uh, raising awareness. Here the point is that the DPO should be able to contact the uh, top management of the company and to inform them on what is the situation, what must be improved, uh, what is clearly not good enough, uh, where are the risks, and how give advices and how to comply at the end of the day with the GDPR rules. Uh, there was a, um, a series of uh, decisions from various data protection authorities, but uh, in May in Luxembourg by the CNPD. And uh, amongst those decisions, it was clearly uh, mentioned that there is a need to be able to document and to demonstrate a direct link between the DPO and the top management of the company. When we're talking about a group, this could become a bit complicated because uh, most of the worldwide or European group will appoint one group DPO. And then the key point is to uh, have uh, to demonstrate, to be able to demonstrate that if there is the appointment of a local DPO or the group DPO, there will be a direct access to the top management of the local company and not only of the top management of the group. This is extremely important to be able to document, and this is one of the points that we understood from the recent decision of the CNPD. The DPO shall be a single point of contact. That means that it will be the point of contact for the uh, local uh, national data protection authority, for the personal, uh, for the people involved in case of data breach, in case of questions uh, internally or externally. That does not mean that it shall be alone on board, because of course, depending on the size of the company, it will be able or will not be able to, um, to, to, to do all the work alone. So on this, he will have to uh, have enough additional people in his team to be able to have an effective ability to answer in due time to all uh, data protection question and points. There is also a need of expertise. Uh, one of the recent decisions in Luxembourg mentioned a minimum of three year professional experience in data protection. This is not something that is strict, but at least you have to demonstrate that the person who are appointed as DPO have a knowledge in data protection. That means not only a knowledge from a technical standpoint, but also from a legal standpoint. So you have to find this, uh, this very rare um, professional who will be on one side a lawyer dedicated with experience on data protection, and on the other side an engineer in uh, IT, cybersecurity, and systems. So this is something quite rare. So the idea is for large companies when it's feasible to organize a group, uh, with those values um, uh, set of knowledge. For smaller companies, it's of course uh, more complicated to find this internally. So it's allowed that those companies be held by third party service providers assisting them. Um, then there is a need to document the opinion of the DPO. It's not only that the DPO must be there, you have to have a file where the DPO will record what he has said to the top management, what were the recommendations, and what is the follow-up of those recommendations. This is something known for years in the financial world because of the recommendation of the CSSF, because of a need to be able to follow up what has been said and what has been in at the end of the day implemented. This is not something so familiar for the other industry in Luxembourg. So this is something uh, to be uh, to, to, to keep in mind, it's 
very important to be able to document what were the recommendations of the DPO and how what was the, the, the next steps further those, those recommendations. And last but not least, cooperation with the authority. The DPO will be the contact point with the authority. We have the chance in Luxembourg to have a CNPD that is available, which answer to the phone calls and which give um, clear uh, explanation as, as long as it's possible to have a clear explanation, which is not on, always the case. And last point, the independence. And on the independence of a DPO, I will uh, come back to what uh, Andrew was saying a few minutes before, uh, the DPO and the conflict of his interest. This is something, this is a very hard topic. Again, another one you will say, um, the, the data protection officer may fulfill other tasks and duties. This is uh, Article 38.6 of the GDPR. But the controller or processor should ensure that any such task and duties do not result in a conflict of interest. So two decisions, one coming from the Belgium Data Protection Authority in 2020, a company was fined of uh, 50,000 euros because they appointed as DPO the head of compliance, risk management and audit. The result, the, the, the reproach, uh, was that for the, the Belgium authority, there was a conflict of interest because this uh, head of compliance and risk was able to determine, to determine the purposes and means of processing within the context of compliance. So he was on one side, the one who was fixing the rules and the, the other side, the one who was challenging the rules. He was the judge and the party. So this makes sense in this, uh, in this situation. Uh, there is another decision coming from the Luxembourg uh, CNPD, which imposes a call to order, appel à l'ordre, with injunction to comply uh, with this uh, Article 38.6, in a company where the CCO, the Chief Compliant Officer, was appointed as DPO. So when re while reading the decision, which is available on the CNPD website, uh, there is a general um, uh, sentence saying, uh, function that may uh, give rise to a conflict of interest within the conflict of interest of the organization may include the following function of senior management. So first, senior management, general manager, operational manager, financial manager, chief medical officer, head of the marketing department, head of, head of human resource, head of IT management as well. So clearly the CISO and the DPO, this is not something that goes very well together on the same, on the same body. In this situation, what was raised by the CNPD uh, was the ability to determine purposes and means uh, in the context of IML KYC. So more or less, it was the same idea. You cannot on one side fix the rules and on the other side be the one who will check that the rules are compliant because you are judge and party. So again, this makes sense. So the position and the conflict of interest, interest for a DPO is something that is sensitive and that should be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. You will have to determine whether the DPO has the ability to fix the rules he will have to challenge at the end of the day. And if it's the case, you will have to remove this part of his duty from the, 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 the activity, either uh, probably the other one uh, and not the one uh, of DPO. So there is not a clear and permanent uh, prohibition to, to, to have those two uh, elements, but still this is something sensitive and when you are in this situation, you have to document your position and, and be able to explain why you decided, despite those, recommend, those general recommendations, to move forward in one or other direction. It brings up a, an interesting question about software startups where the CISO is typically reporting into the VP of engineering or the CTO, they're a non-executive security enforcer. And then they are given the DPO task. That's, you know, that really couldn't be the, the CISO fund or the security functions already a conflict of interest. And then you're ascribing data protection to that person as well. And they're embedded within the engineering team. So I would, uh, that brings up a good question to ask some of those companies that you're dealing with as to where they sit in the organizational hierarchy as well. Well, 
this is this is clearly a very complicated situation when there is a company with 10 people in uh, this is not always possible to have someone being able beside uh, the top management to uh, to to take the position of dpo this from a practic pragmatical standpoint this is not always possible however it seems that in the coming months, years, there will be a differentiation between companies dealing with sensitive data and IT data. And for those companies, in my view, they, at the end of the day, they will be treated as, as if they were treated health data. So that will be something you have to consider in your business model from the beginning. So this will, in my view, not be possible in the future for a startup to develop a tool, a very efficient tool dealing with uh, personal data, but think, with the set the mindset that you will not have to pay you will not have to have cost for the security of your data and the generally speaking gdpr or data protection compliance this this is the way i see things this is not clearly stated this way for the time being but at least the recommendation since two years always goes in the same direction the more you treat personal data if it's your business uh, model then you will have to organize things around uh, a security, a, a DPO. If you have not that internally, you will have to appoint an external DPO. But this will be a cost for you because the data are considered as sensitive. So uh, unfortunately, uh, the business model where you run in your garage, uh, you develop a software uh, without taking care of the, of the way of the security and so on, because it works, which are the models we can see in the movies when we hear about the beginning of Microsoft, of Google, of uh, LinkedIn, and so on. To me, this will not be possible anymore due to this major, major need of, of security when it comes to personal data, but personal opinion on this. Um, then uh, the possibilities are either to appoint an internal DPO or an external DPO like like uh, law firms, we, we, we have this, uh, this, uh, this service for our clients or, or various type of, uh, of entities. Uh, the pros and cons uh, for the internal, you have a complete view on the, on the system, on the company, on the structure and processing, which is not always the case when you are an external DPO where you will be there a couple of hours per week uh, to, to check things. Uh, the internal DPO is there, so is available uh, all the time, so probably will be more reactive and it will keep the expertise uh, layout after layout on what has been done in this company. Uh, the external DPO, from an economical standpoint, this will be most of the time less expensive. Less expensive because you will not have to dedicate someone to this uh, activity. This will be a kind of part-time activity uh, with the crown, with the, 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 the less good points uh, that we will see. A key point here is the independence uh, of the external DPO. When you work with an external DPO, you have to watch in the agreement the, uh, you have to be sure that there will be no conflict of interest. As an example, Luxembourg is a small country. If you have an external DPO dealing in a certain industry, after a couple of uh, years, there will be a situation where the same external DPO will have to treat a data breach between a processor and a controller, and it will be the, data, the external DPO on both sides. And this is not a situation that is acceptable. This is clearly a conflict of interest. So the question is what will happen in this situation? This is a position that will not be handleable uh, in the time. This is, this is something you uh, as client, if you appoint an external DPO, have to, um, to care about. Internal DPO, negative point, it's the risk of dependence, of course. Uh, most of the time it will be an employee, so it will be under the supervision of the, of the company. Uh, even though the GDPR grants him um, a total autonomy and independence in his activity as DPO, uh, that, will, that might be complicated depending on the style of the company or the culture of the company to keep the, 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 the awareness uh, at the best level, 
especially if it has a cost, especially if the data protection is not well handled in this company. So the position of the, of the DPO might be a bit complicated. That will also increase uh, the workload of this uh, employee because generally, with some exceptions for large company, but most of the time, this will not be a 100% time dedicated to, um, to, to, to DPO rules. So we will have to uh, handle the other things. And last point, uh, and I come back to what I've already, already said, generally this person will be either a legal or a tech people, uh, not both. So a loan that will be complicated internally to, um, to, 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 to uh, fulfill the knowledge that is needed in this position. If you opt for an external DPO, of course there will be a less good knowledge of the company, but still that can, that can be uh, tackled with the time. Uh, it's, easy, it's easier for an external DPO to gather uh, the, the technical uh, aspects that he doesn't have himself. We as lawyers, we are not IT engineer, we, 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 but we work with companies like Damovo when it's needed because they have the knowledge that we don't have and vice versa. So both possibilities are open. And for the just a review of what a CISO should be or has historically been. Um, they're, they're supposed to be a senior level executive that is developing, updating, measuring the cybersecurity program for the organization. So they've historically been responsible for keeping customer data secure and compliant with international regulatory compliance mandates, uh, whether it be SOX, PCI, HIPAA, um, the, the idea of privacy, as I've said before, is new because it has not really been seen as an internal or external threat to the business, but it really does need to be because the, uh, the idea that the organization could be fined for being non-compliant and not protecting the data of their customers or you know as a provider or as a, a service provider to another customer that has real consequences that these organizations will react to because there is a monetary penalty ascribed to a, an event of this type. And that's unfortunately how a lot of organizations think. They won't, uh, they won't really react until you threaten to adversely affect their ability to maintain their current money and generate additional revenue. So it's one of the threats that works. Uh, CISO will likely work next to the CIO CTO to get cybersecurity products and services. Uh, they will have a, a big part in the disaster recovery and business continuity. And as we've kind of talked about today, the ability to access that, that privacy laden data now has to be considered as part of the disaster recovery and business continuity plan. Uh, with regards to GDPR, Historically, the CISO's role has been to make sure that the business strategy is enforced by the security strategy or is a, I guess, met by the security strategy. So you cannot do anything from a security and compliance point of view that goes against the ideals and the long-term or short-term strategy of the business. Now, they have to consider if the security and compliance strategy adversely impacts or negates anything that the DPO or the privacy side of things is implementing, because they are also making sure that the business is protected from a, an international privacy standpoint, but they are also the advocates for the customer data. So they're playing both sides 
Uh, obviously, they're being paid by the organization to protect them and make sure that the secure or that the, the privacy uh, essentials are covered. But they also have to have, you know, they've got the, the devil on their shoulder saying, hey, by the way, don't forget that if you do this, it's going to adversely impact customers, which is going to adversely impact the business and could cause problems. So as a CISO, if you are a CISO now, not only do you need to know security, compliance, business knowledge, and leadership and management, you now have to have at least, I don't want to say tertiary knowledge, but you need to have some knowledge in international privacy legislation and rules, privacy governance, privacy architecture, and then data persistence across your partners and customers. And I will tell you that this is not something that most CISOs are exposed to. I was exposed to this very early because I used to work in the, uh, the privacy commissioner's office in Ottawa and Canada. And they are the ones that defined privacy for the entire company or for the entire country. So I was exposed to it really through osmosis, I got to hear everything that was going around and I was just responsible for firewall rules, but I was indoctrinated in privacy and that's always really affected my decisions over the last 20 plus years, but it's not something that everyone is exposed to as part of a security or compliance uh, career progression track. It's just new. I suspect it will be going forward. There are certifications now, like ISACA has the CDPSE, uh, and that's going to be the first of many privacy-related certifications for data security types of people. To continue with what you were saying, Andrew, the last point is about GDPR certification. That will be very quick. The idea is simply to present a new tool that is coming on the, on the market and that might help some of the companies dealing with data. Well, old companies are, are dealing with data, well, with personal data, but some of them might uh, go through, through this uh, certification process. So the GDPR provides the, the right, the opportunity to develop and apply certification schemes. So far, uh, none of, there, there, there is no certification applicable in EU. There are two uh, process uh, under supervision and uh, fair enough, both come from Luxembourg. The first one comes is called uh, Euro Privacy. We will see that in a second, uh, and it it was uh, pro, it, it's a, it's a private uh, association um, development, and the second one has been developed by the CNPD itself. It's called CARPA. Uh, so one uh, is on the way to be approved by the at the European level, so it will be applicable in all EU countries. The second one. Uh, should be once finally approved, applicable in Luxembourg. Uh, the idea of this is being accountable. This is an advantage of the market. This is not the alpha and uh, omega of the, this is not the, the full solution. Once you are certified, that doesn't mean that it's done, you have nothing else to do. But this is a way to control that what you have already implemented complies with the rules. And this is also a, a method, a process, uh, to, to maintain the, the level of, uh, to upgrade uh, from time to time and to maintain the right level of compliance with GDPR. Um, so here is uh, one of the two, a privacy certification. We at DSM uh, are about to be appointed uh, to sign the agreement with, uh, with Euro privacy. Uh, on this type of uh, clients files, we uh, probably will work with Damovo uh, for the security aspect because this is something, I mean, GDPR, generally speaking, is some things that uh, relies on two legs. One side is the legal, the other side is the cyber security. Uh, and this is how we terminate the, this, uh, this presentation.
So uh, first, thank you to everyone for attending. You could see there was uh, more or less 100 people uh, virtually attending. So thank you for your participation. And now we will uh, go through a Q&A uh, session. So the first question we have, shouldn't DPOs be trained also to perform a full DPIA, which includes the technical skills necessary to understand where the data transit and is being processed to verify that it is dealt with by processor that are processing data in a GDPR compliant way. Um, my answer, my first answer uh, would be no. Um, the idea is not to make an audit. The idea is to really rely on uh, third party uh, opinion and uh, advices. So uh, to me, the, 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 the DPIA is the summary of what exists in terms of legal, in terms of security, but that doesn't mean that performing the DPIA should be equal to a full technical audit, in my opinion. What do you think, Andrew? I think that DPOs should know how to conduct a DPIA instead of just responding to them, uh, just for their own edification more than anything. But the, I agree with you, the audit function is not something that should fall on them. That's a third party should be handling that side of things. Another question, most European small and medium enterprise rely on um, uh, AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure to provide services to their customer. Can the law realistically be applied in this context? Well, this is the, all the point about Schrems 2. Uh, there is no clear answer for the time being. Uh, it will depend on the assessment you're able to do, type of data, type of clientele, and so on. But you have, uh, certainly, uh, you will not be in position not to use any of those companies as service providers. So you will have to find a way to handle this uh, with an assessment, with additional security measure, technical uh, evolution. But... Uh, for the time being, it is allowed, and to my knowledge, there is no decision against one of those companies saying you should not work anymore with them because there are U.S. companies. Uh, uh, there is a question about the recent 6 October decision of the Irish data protection against Facebook. Uh, I, I, I know it has been said, but I did not uh, read this in detail so far, so I will not be able to answer. Facebook need not to rely on user consent to process EU user data archived through a loophole by simply adding data processing specification in its general terms and condition, changing acceptance into a contract. So if I understand correctly, that means that would mean that according to the Irish uh, authority, uh, the requirement should not be needed as long as it's written in the general terms and condition that uh, while uh, using, you agree, something like that. I, I have no answer, unfortunately. Uh, it's too recent for me to have a, an opinion on this. So uh, I will check and uh, next time we will uh, put this in the conference. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, or regarding the huge amount of networking devices, um, is it the one who brings the device into the market who has to provide the data protection guarantee, or can you, in um, damages and liability questions, also refer to the DPOs of the suppliers in the supply chain? So, so I, I'm not. So the, the question is about the role of DPO in supply chain, and notably Internet of uh, of Tools. Uh, who has the, the the liability, on who uh, handle the liability uh, to comply with GDPR rules? That will depend on the situation and on the type of services. You will have first to define who is the controller, who is the processor, and and at the end of the day. The responsible will be the, the well, they will be jointly uh, responsible. There was a decision uh, where uh, uh, processor was sentenced together with the controller for a security breach. 
So it's not, it's the time where the, the processor was not responsible is over. So uh, whatever the situation is, both of them will have to uh, carry the, 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 the responsibility to check this. But clearly, uh, this will be the importator who will have the main liability, who will face the, the first uh, uh, duty to answer to the data protection authority or to the client or at the end of the day to a court. Uh, and then he will also call, if there is a court case, call to the case uh, the, the sub-processor. So there is no clear answer, but if it's, uh, if it's a supply chain, I would say that all of them will have their role to play. Uh, one, more question. one more question, and then we will terminate the session. Uh, regarding data transfer agreements, what is the more relevant standpoint to establish whether the company needs TT, DTA in place to look the location of the company, EU, non-EU, or location of company companies to whom the company does business with? Well, if I understand the question, it's about the uh, applicability of the GDPR uh, for, from a geographical standpoint. So it applies to companies located in EU or, company, or to company uh, dealing with EU citizens. So uh, it's very large. Uh, and as long as you are in one of those situations, then you will have to apply GDPR. So in other words, you will not have to apply GDPR if you are located outside of Europe and if you are not treating or not processing European citizens' data. Andrew, do you uh, want to have the final word? I don't know what to say. <laughs> Put me on the spot. Uh, just that, you know, the like anything in security compliance and privacy there is no stock answer to everything um you you really do need to do the research and ask the right people in order to uh, see what fits best for your organization and your situation so lean on uh, lean on your resources as best you can to help you get the job done Thank you very much, and uh, for the people here, now it's time for a drink. Have a nice end of the day, everyone. <laughs>